ancestors began coming to the shores of Newfoundland nearly 500 years ago. Fishermen following in the wake of Cabot, they entered a world that was startlingly different from the rich farmlands they left behind in England and Ireland. But the landscape was irrelevant. The towering cliffs and drifting ice didn't matter. They came to fish, not to settle. The seas around Newfoundland were rich beyond their wildest dreams. Codfish were unbelievably abundant. Salted and dried in the sun, it soon became a staple food throughout Europe. In the early days, permanent settlement was discouraged. Crews would sail back home after the fishing season. For a long while, Newfoundland was regarded as an overseas fishing platform and training ground for the Royal Navy rather than a colony. Sending ships to Newfoundland was the great mercantile adventure of the time, especially in places such as Poole in Dorset. This is the port a great many of our ancestors sailed from. These are the streets they walked, often dodging the press gangs as they signed on for a voyage to Newfoundland. Ellen Perry describes Poole's golden age, the exciting early days when hundreds of ships and thousands of men would set sail for Newfoundland. The height of the trade in, shall we say, uh, during the Napoleonic War, uh, 1800, 1810, where in fact uh, from this port during the springtime up to 350 ships would leave this port and sail off uh, to these tremendously productive waters of, uh, of Newfoundland. Just imagine uh, the bustle and industry on this quay when they had to get off maybe 50 ships in a week of all the sailors and the provisions and everything that had to be loaded and sent off. It really was an amazingly busy little port at that time. The dominance of West Country ports in the salt cod fishery waned as more and more fishermen defied the authorities and put down roots in Newfoundland. Memories of England and Ireland faded as succeeding generations established a new and unique identity. Life was not easy for the fishermen settlers and their families. Incomes from the catching and curing of codfish often pitifully low. Still, communities grew and through great resourcefulness people survived. Outport Newfoundlanders kept a few animals and grew their own crops. They built their own fishing vessels and homes, and they made their own furniture. Simple tables and chairs and dressers, created from local balsam fir and white birch. Living in sparsely populated and often isolated outports, fishermen and handymen copied and adapted freely often combining patterns from various sources when making one piece of furniture. Take this low-backed settle, for instance. It was made around 1929 by Billy Wheeler, a fisherman who lived in Keels, Bonavista Bay. It has the general proportions and sense of design of settles made in Scotland during the 19th century. Its depth suggests its use for both lying and sitting down. The elegantly scrolled arms are reminiscent of those made for some fashionable English armchairs during the 17th century and of Scottish join chairs of the Restoration period. The open apron is patterned after chamfered Munton bars, seen in church windows such as this one in Harbour Grace. The back is made of V-jointed matched lumber, similar to that used in early 20th century pews. A wide range of influences in Billy Wheeler's work. But what of the traditions passed on from his ancestors, the men and women who came here from the British Isles so long ago? This is the land most of our people came from, the West Country of England, Dorset, Somerset, Devon, West Hampshire. A beautiful land of rolling hills, of lush farmland and ancient villages. Dr. Gordon Hancock is an authority on the movement of people from England to Newfoundland. Dorset is one of the principal counties of origin of English Newfoundlanders, particularly along the northeast coast, and Notre Dame Bay, Bonavista Bay, Trinity Bay, Conception Bay, and along the south coast. Uh, it was involved in the fishery for a long period of time, and people decided to stay over there. I mean, you can sort any name lists from uh, even current phone books or signs in shop windows and so on, you'll find a, 
the compatibility with uh, Newfoundland names, particularly up in the Blackmore Vale and Sturmish and Newton, which uh, names up there read like a telephone book of Twinningate or, or Grand Bank. Well, they came from virtually all uh, branches of uh, Dorset society, the mercantile class, the trading class, and the laboring class, from farms and quarries, and uh, out of market towns, sons of butchers, and uh, tinsmiths, and blacksmiths, and carpenters, and masons, and uh, all the trades. Uh, but the bulk, it would have come from the laboring classes of both the market towns and from the farms. Dorset today, cars and trucks wend their way through narrow ancient streets. Thatched roof cottages survive, and so does market day, when farmers and peddlers set up booths and ply their wares. This is Sturminster Newton, where a great many Newfoundlanders trace their ancestry. Today, the West Country is one of the most attractive regions of England. Pretty villages, scenic countryside. But this ancient and beautiful land was not such a good place in which to live back in the 18th and early 19th centuries, at least not for the working classes. It was a time of unrest and social upheaval. The ancient rural way of life was being eroded by the industrial age. Living conditions were wretched, and many of our ancestors left to escape the grinding poverty of rural life in old England. The furniture of the working class at the time was simple, basic, functional. John Walker of Dorchester is a dealer in West Country furniture. Because of the, the social conditions of the time, um, most people, most farm laborers and, and the like, moved around fairly frequently, almost on an annual basis. So although these, uh, these pieces um, were finally collected from uh, the Blackmore Vale district, they could have been made anywhere in the West Country, but they're more, more than likely Dorset pieces. Um, they'll illustrate the, um, the very simple techniques that were used to make quite um, utilitarian but useful furniture, um, and the sort of things that then often survive because they were never valued as um, big, great works of art by their original owners, nor by collectors until almost our own generation. They fall into a pattern of furniture making which has its roots um, probably in antiquity but certainly um, surviving pieces from the Middle Ages are constructionally very little different. The most primitive uh, form, if you like, from the uh, construction point of view would be this uh, simple stool which as you see consists merely of a, a substantial slab of wood with uh, four simple legs just literally um, driven into, uh, into holes drilled in it. Um, sort of thing that's certainly existed um, since time immemorial in the West Country, probably all over Britain, and the sort of thing that could be made by someone with um, minimum uh, tools at their disposal and really requires um, a minimum of skill to produce. Yet the fact that it's still with us after maybe um, 170 years of use must show that um, it is a, uh, a useful and robust form. Country furniture, simple and sturdy, furniture our ancestors would have made and used before they sailed away to a new life in a new land. Though homemade with the simplest of tools, some old West Country furniture shows flair and style. Michael Legg, another antique furniture dealer in Dorchester, is particularly proud of this stool, made about the time our people left for the New World. Uh, because of its wonderful character and marvelous color and, and surface patina, would be considered a highly desirable and therefore a very valuable thing. This one has got e enormous character, and I'm certain that when this was made, that they didn't consider the, the knot to be a blemish but was part of the character of the wood. And of course, usually in timber, by the side or around a knot, you, you get an interesting figure, as we have here, this rippling uh, in the wood. Uh, the, the seat is, is elm. If we can see what the legs are. And the legs are ash. Ash is a resilient, uh, springy type of wood and therefore could be cut 
into quite small sections and still be strong. The usual type. These exist in today in quantity, but uh, this is a rarer type. I suppose now the people who went out to Newfoundland would have, would have used whatever local wood was available. Whatever was available, mm -hmm. and used very basic furniture making techniques, such as riving or splitting, um, planing, sawing, and usually finished with either linseed oil or varnish. Are these skills done now? That no. Um, there are still a few old people practicing, and young people are taking it up. It's known as green wood furniture, because this would have been made uh, when the wood was green. It was softer and easier to work. Homemade furniture from the old country, traditional styles and patterns that would have been remembered by our ancestors and perhaps continued in the new world. However, not all Newfoundland outport furniture was homemade. Many items show a standard of skill and knowledge of design which suggests they were made by trained woodworkers. This Newfoundland kitchen dresser, for instance, is from Trinity East. Made from balsam fir about 1840, its design is closely similar to a particular group of dressers made in Dorset about the same time. When the Newfoundland dresser and this example from Dorset are compared, the transmission of design from skilled tradesmen in the West Country to the earliest major settlement in Newfoundland is clearly illustrated. This is not surprising. During the late 18th century and early 19th century, British shipwrights, joiners, and carpenters were brought to Newfoundland by the well-to-do fish merchants to construct and repair their fishing premises and vessels. It's most likely these tradesmen made furniture as well. The Trinity Bay dresser was most probably made by such a migrant Dorset tradesman. Not all Newfoundlanders are rooted in the west country of England. Many would feel more at home here in southeastern Ireland. The faces seem familiar. The names are the same as in parts of Newfoundland, especially on the southern and Cape shores. And it's not surprising for a great many of our ancestors sailed from the quay here in Waterford. The English ships, en route to the Newfoundland fishing grounds, would put in for salt pork and other provisions, and to top up their fishing crews with Irish youngsters. Many came from the surrounding farms and villages, where it was difficult to scrape a living in those troubled times. Like our West Country ancestors, most would have not had any special training in woodworking or furniture making. Furniture in an Irish cottage at the time would have been made at home or by the local handyman. Country furniture is of great interest to collectors such as Met McNulty, for they reflect the lifestyle of the time and the Irish Newfoundland connection. Uh, the first of these is the, the, the fairly common cradle. And the thing that distinguishes this cradle and some of the cradles that are found in Newfoundland is the position of these rockers here at the end. And what happened was that the, the woman would attach a piece of string or cord or rope to the end of the cradle. And when she got into bed, uh, she would be able to pull the rope and rock the cradle without getting out. Now, it, it's also part of the construction of the cradle. And you can see almost identical examples to this uh, in the collection of furniture in Newfoundland. The second item we have here is, is a chair, a little simple stick-back armchair made for a child. And again, the construction of this and the design of this is very similar to the furniture which occurs in Newfoundland. And this shows the continuity, if you like, of the, the craft tradition from the uh, southern part of the United Kingdom, from the southeastern part of Ireland, which were brought across the ocean to Newfoundland by your early settlers. And these are part of the remembered items which they brought with them, the cradle and the child's chair. While some items of Newfoundland furniture have an overall design similar to examples in the British Isles, others, such as this rocking chair, have only decorations which suggest an old world connection. The hand-whittled, painted armchair on rockers was made from balsam fir by Michael Morrissey of Harbour Grace, Conception Bay, around 1915. 
The rope twist carving is a nautical reference and was often used by carpenters in the coastal towns of southern Ireland to embellish furniture. The waves on this Irish chair is another nautical link. This chair is from the west of Ireland, which uh, experiences the Atlantic Ocean. And the general belief uh, from the folk culture is that these represent the waves of the ocean. So it's a motif that the sailors of the west of Ireland and the sailors of Newfoundland would both have been very familiar with. And this movement then reflects itself into the folk art, which is expressed through their furniture. So you'll see the waves in the new uh, Foundland furniture are actually much larger than these. And that probably represents the, the higher seas, maybe, that occurred in those latitudes rather than in the west of Ireland. But it, it is a link, again, in the culture chain, uh, which unites the furniture of Newfoundland with the, with the furniture of the west of Ireland and with the furniture of the south east of Ireland. Another decorative feature commonly noted in Ireland is the heart. The heart decoration also appears on a number of carved and painted Newfoundland items in the Roots exhibition. This colorful wall hanging box is one example. Many motifs, including the heart, can be traced not only to Ireland, but to other Celtic areas as well, in Cornwall, Wales, and Scotland. These motifs include the recurring Celtic decoration of a spiral of teardrop shapes. Other designs include hearts, diamonds or lozenge-shaped devices, and compass-made embellishments, which are often used in combination with chip-carved motifs. The delightful thing about regional furniture, and particularly the furniture of Newfoundland, is the further away you get, like you are, from the mainstream influences of continental Europe and the United Kingdom, the more the uh, artistic efforts of the craftsman flourishes. So in looking through your furniture, you see these magnificent scrolls and curves that are in the furniture, and this is pure artistic expression. And this is what makes Newfoundland furniture the property, the cultural property uh, of Newfoundland. And that's why it's so important to people like me who, who study furniture. Because uh, here is the element that is uniquely Newfoundland. So you have the skill of the carpenter. You have the remembered items that they've brought with them from the old country. You have the available materials in terms of the wood that was available to them. And the final ingredient which makes you unique is the ingredient of the imagination of the craftsman himself, unconstrained by the rules back home, if you like, in the UK or in continental Europe. So he allows himself a lot more self-expression in the furniture, as we did in Ireland, as you did even more than we did in Newfoundland. That's the joy of the whole thing, and that's the important social and cultural aspect of it. Newfoundland outport furniture of the 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries. A reflection a blend of many influences, of the sea and isolation, of a new life in a new world, and of remembered traditions from the old countries, southeastern Ireland and the west country of England, the lands from whence so many of our people came. The exhibition you're about to see attempts to contribute to the understanding and appreciation of Newfoundland outport furniture by exploring routes which lead to the earliest sources of its design. This process, which involves retracing the movements of early inhabitants and migrant woodworkers to their home regions, can also be an effective and exciting way to investigate furniture from other regions of Canada.